Hey, it's Dr. Mike T. Nelson here, and we're talking about the impact of sleep here and how you can go from also just surviving to <clears throat> thriving in regards to sleep. So a big thank you also to Jess for setting this up and also to my wife Jody for helping out with everything. She will be showing up in this lecture towards the end also. So you don't have to listen to me, I'm at you forever. So what about survival with sleep? And yes, as you figured out, sleep is incredible for your survival. If we do not have adequate sleep over time, it can result in death. So we do need sleep in order to survive and the exact reason for that is still up for debate and we probably don't really know. Um, but if we look at it from a ancestral perspective, sleep must serve some very important roles in order for us to be kind of out of commission for that amount of time per night and susceptible to other predators, things of that nature. So. We're still trying to figure out exactly why we need sleep, but we do definitely know that it is essential for survival. <clears throat> so quick background, I did a PhD in exercise physiology, looking mostly at metabolic flexibility, presented to DARPA on that topic, do some peer reviews, publish some research. Well, before that, I did a master's in mechanical engineering. I own my own business, Extreme Human Performance, uh, which my wife Jody works there also. Associate Professor at the Kerrig Institute for Clinical Neuroscience, instructor at Rocky Mountain University, uh, do some sports nutrition, and also certified strength and conditioning specialist. So for sleep, what is fascinating to me is other mammals. So dolphins have something which is called Yumi Hemispheric Slow Wave Sleep. So within a 24-hour period, each half of the brain gets about four hours of slow wave sleep. So they kind of oscillate between one side of their brain and the other side back and forth. So one side uh, can kind of sleep for a period of time and the other side is awake and then vice versa. Um, to me, which I thought that was pretty fascinating. I was wondering, I wonder how humans, if we could do that, could I get more hours out of the day? Could I just kind of shut off half my brain for part of the day? I guess maybe others would argue maybe I already do that, but I'm not getting sleep. <clears throat> so real quick rundown of sleep 101. The master regulator of sleep is this structure called the SCN in the brain. This is where a lot of the light cues come in, and this is the main structure that is going to regulate sleep. We found that there's what multiple what they call clock genes in all tissues. So the idea of chronobiology is becoming more and more studied and we have more information on it now. Um, but timekeeping in all tissue is super important. So the main one is the SCN, but all other tissues that we've looked at so far have these clock genes. So they have a way of kind of tracking time. So we know that sleep is essential. It's essential for a whole bunch of things. Uh, one of them being memory formation, how you remember stuff or something called LTP, long-term potentiation. And this includes motor memory and processing. They did some really cool studies with rats. They had them go through a maze and then they watched the little electrical synapses kind of light up when the rats were sleeping and it was like they were going through the maze again at different speeds, right? So if you've ever done a motor task and weren't quite able to get it, have gone to bed and got up the next morning and were able to do it. Uh, that is a motor processing due to sleep. I've done that a little bit recently. I have a, <clears throat> a board here where I'm trying to practice kind of balancing on this little tube, uh, an effort to try to get better at balancing on a surfboard. And I was able to roll out to one side, not quite make it. And the other side, like at best, I could stay in the middle for maybe about three seconds. And went to bed, woke up the next day, and I could pretty do six to 10 seconds pretty easily. 
Now again, obviously that's a n equals one. Um, but I think this has happened to people where they were not quite where they wanted to be for a motor skill, go to bed, wake up the next day, and they're actually better at it. There's some very good science to support that too. We know that in general, if we divide sleep up, we have different phases. Uh, the main ones being what's called deep sleep, REM sleep, and then also slow wave sleep. We can look at sleep efficiency. Um, there's different devices that will track this now. Like I use an Aura device, which I like. If you're seeing 100% sleep efficiency, I can almost guarantee that you're in a very high state of sleep deprivation. So for quite a while, I've used even like older devices. I don't know if anyone remembers like the old Zio device. Where you put this thing on your forehead and it measures uh, movement and EEG. I thought that if I could just compress my sleep, could I go from sleeping nine hours to six hours a night and still have the same beneficial effects? In short, not that I've seen that so far. Um, we'll talk about what are kind of mins you can get by with sleep. Um, but if I see someone score and they're super high efficiency, odds are that they're very sleep deprived. Uh, another key is kind of latency. So when your head hits the pillow, if you're out within a couple minutes or even a few seconds, I can almost guarantee that you are probably very sleep deficient. It should take you a few minutes. Now it shouldn't take you a half hour or an hour to go to sleep, but it should take you a few minutes. That's pretty normal. And if your head hits the pillow and you're out, odds are you're probably in a pretty high amount of a sleep debt. So what is one of the records for the longest documented time without sleep? And what are some of the consequences of that? So if you had to survive without sleep or very, very minimal sleep, what are some things that may happen to you? And it so happens that if we look at this, there is a very interesting case study. Uh, this is from a guy named Randy Gardner. Uh, he has the record, the scientifically documented record via Guinness, a longest a human has intentionally gone without sleep. And in this case, they were not using any stimulants of any kind. So in 1964, he stayed awake for 11 days and 25 minutes, which is absolutely crazy. If any of you have pulled an all-nighter or have had long periods of time without sleep, <clears throat> this to me is just astronomical and sounds just ob obliviously horrible. This was a world record, but then was later outlawed because it's far too dangerous. So this record still stands, but there are no longer any attempts at this. And what's pretty cool is this is all actually documented in the reference there below. Of course, here's what happens most of the time when you go to sleep management course, so hopefully you're not sleeping during this one. When we look at his Randy's record here, um, it's a really good illustration of different things that happen. So on day two, uh, difficulty focusing the eyes and different signs of astrogenesis. Probably just slaughtered that, but it's a difficulty recognizing objects only by touch. So day three, he had moodiness, some signs of what's called ataxia. So ataxia is a fancy, uh, again, neural word to be an inability to repeat simple tongue twisters, right? So we've got a motor function, it's not working the way that it should, right? So your tongue is a controlled by that. And obviously a large muscle has to have a lot of fine motor skill in order to speak. So already by day three, he's becoming very moody and seeing signs of just simple tongue twisters he's not able to do. So day four, irritability, an uncooperative attitude, starting to have memory lapses, difficulty concentrating. He actually has his very first hallucination. Uh, he hallucinated that a street sign was a person, followed by a delusional episode in which he imagined he was a famous black football player. Right, So this is on day four of no sleep. So he's already having massive hallucinations four days into it. Day five, more hallucinations. 
seeing the path extending from the room in front of him down through a quiet forest, uh, sometimes described where he would be recognized for a little while and then having these other visions again. So he's already completely lost and having a hard time differentiating what is kind of real life and what is not. So day six, speech slowing and difficult naming just common objects, right? So that is not good. Day seven, irritability, slurred speech, increasing memory lapses. Day nine, episodes of fragmented thinking, frequently beginning but not finishing sentences. Day 10, paranoia focused on a radio show host who Gardner felt was trying to make him appear foolish because he was having difficulty remembering some details about his vigil. And day 11, expressionless appearance, speech slurred and without intonation, had to be encouraged to talk to get to respond is all. Attention span was very short and his mental abilities were diminished. All right, so 11 days without any sleep. And as we saw early on, even after just a short period of time, it's already having issues, which continue to get worse. So day 11 was what's called a serial sevens test where the respondent starts with the number 100, proceeds to count backwards, subtracting by seven each time. Uh, Gardner got back to 65 with only a subtraction and then stopped. Uh, when asked why he stopped, he claimed that he couldn't remember what he was supposed to be doing. <laughs> so on a very simple task, was not able to remember even that task at all. So we know sleep has very profound effects. Uh, the 2007 Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine was awarded to three principal scientists who contributed to the discovery of a network of genes and proteins regulating the circadian rhythms based on light and dark cycles. So again, we're learning a lot more about sleep and how it's regulated. One of the main questions with sleep is, well, how much sleep do we really need? Now, again, this is going to vary a lot from one individual to the next. Uh, but they did this study in the Arctic Circle, and when they conducted the study, they had 24 hours of daylight. So from the outside, they didn't have any of these influences of light or dark cycles. They took all watches, clocks, and their timekeeping devices were removed, right? So taking out other external sources of timekeeping. Only the station's computers tracked the time the team went to sleep and went to, were awake. So they said, hey, just go about your normal task. When you need to sleep, just sleep. And when you want to wake up, just wake up and go back to work. So no researchers did their work and choose to sleep or awake according to their body time. So basically whatever they felt like. What did they find? On average, the sleep daily time was 10.3 hours. So every member of a team showed an increase in sleep time. Uh, the shortest time was 8.8 .8 hours a day. So that was the shortest time, right? So most people, if they think they're getting 8.8 .8 hours a day, they're doing really good, which I would agree. The longest time was almost 12 hours a day, right? So now again, this is probably because they had a fair amount of sleep debt um, to repay. Um, but still, when we remove the kind of normal influences that we have, some very interesting data that we need a fair amount of sleep. Now, we don't know if this continued on what they would kind of normalize out at. Um, but what I've seen with based on this and other data, most people need a lot more sleep than what they are giving their body. So here's a conclusion here also. Uh, biological need for sleep may be closer to 10 hours per day. Uh, this is typical of monkeys and apes living in the wild than the usual seven to seven and a half hours, typical of humans today, high tech clock driven society. I also like this, it's from 1995, All right? So 25 years ago, I want to say the average now is like 6.4 hours or 6.2 hours a night. Uh, it's actually unfortunately gotten worse since this uh, study and this quote. Um, but even then, they're talking about what's going on, right? So they propose that maybe we need closer to 10 hours per day. If you told most people that, they would think you're insane. 
Um, I've noticed as of this recording, since I've been at home and been on a very much the same routine for four weeks now, I've been averaging of time that I go to bed and wake up. Not exactly the time I've been asleep per se, but pretty darn close to it. About nine hours and 40 minutes is what I've been averaging. So I would encourage people to get more sleep, probably gonna be beneficial. Um, so are we chronically sleep deprived? <laughs> the thing I loved about this, uh, so people think sleep is a new thing. It is not, right? So Bulletin of Psychomotor or Psychonomic Society, July 1975. So they're asking, are we chronically sleep deprived? Uh, 16 young male subjects, first three nights went to bed at 11 p.m., got up at 8 a. I'm sorry, 7 a.m., so they got good eight hours. Fourth night in bed at 11 p.m., they were allowed to sleep in. So now this is after they've had three nights at around eight hours. So this is called this ad libitum sleep, resulted in 126 minutes more sleep than was found on the third night of controlled sleep. So, right, so over two hours more. These results suggest the hypothesis of living in a contemporary society, right, 1975 is the year after I was born, produces a state of chronic sleep deprivation in humans. And again, so data that we've known about this for quite a while. So can't wake up late if you never go to sleep. Aha. So my one of my experiments with this is several years ago, I was a volunteer person on what was called the Ram Race. So Ram Race is the race across America. <clears throat> we were on Team Strongheart. We started off in California, in San Diego, and we had a team of four people, so four riders. We had more support staff. We only had about 10 support staff, which is really not that many. So we had four riders, and someone had to be riding at any one point in time. So we started out in California. We rode or somebody rode their bike all the way across the US to Atlantic City, New Jersey. So this is gonna take, if it goes well, about seven days. And this is 24 seven because this is a race. You are timed against other people. So we were on a four person team so someone of those riders was riding 24 seven, ideally, from California all the way across the US on a set route. <clears throat> Everybody had to take the same route to New Jersey. So what we did is we had two teams of two. We would have a van follow one person riding. So they would go pretty fast for maybe 30 to 40 minutes. And then they would switch out with another person who would still ride pretty fast 30 to 40 minutes and they would switch out and go back and forth for around four to six hour shifts. They would then ideally try to go to sleep. Next two people would come out, they would alternate back and forth, and this would go on and on. Now, as you can imagine, because this is 24 seven, there is somebody riding at all hours of the day, and they're gonna be awake and asleep, awake and asleep. And you're also, we had only one RV, which was very bumpy. I only got to sleep in the back bed once, but you would hit a bump and you'd fly about two feet up in the air. So I can't say it was the most uh, restful thing at all. So a test of endurance, 3,000 miles in under seven days. And it was a crazy thing. So most of the people here are averaging 20 miles per hour average. Now this includes any stops because the clock is always running. I think we averaged around 19.6 miles per hour. Maybe it was a little bit over that. Uh, we ended up doing pretty good. We ended up getting uh, third place. So after two professional teams, we were not a professional team. Uh, on average, about three hours of sleep per day. And I was a volunteer person for this. So when we first started, I had the first shift and then we had a schedule snafu. So I also got the second shift. So I ended up being awake for 24 hours in a row to start off. And then when I was supposed to go to sleep, we had one of the riders got really dehydrated. It's basically pissing maple syrup. And we had to take him an hour and 40 minutes off course in the car 
to go to the ER to get checked in to see what was going on. Because I started to get really worried when we had him drink more fluid and then he would run outside literally within a few minutes to whiz again. I'm like, oh crap, that is not good. You are not retaining any fluid or electrolytes at all. So he went to the hospital, I took him up there. He got a whole bunch of fluids by IV put back in him. I uh, was told not to race for a while, which you know, he didn't really listen to. But uh, the first time that I got any sleep was around 38 hours into this. I passed out in the lounge area and took a Kleenex box and used that as a pillow. And then fast forward through the next few days, I literally got less than 10 hours of sleep the entire time. And that was pretty bad. It got to be so bad by the end of the third day, we would drop and sometimes follow the riders. So we would have to drop them off and remember how far we were gonna go and then exchange out the next set of riders. And I could not remember a time or a mileage stamp on the clock if my life depended upon me. So luckily there was always a co-pilot, so to speak, with us. So they would have to write down what the actual mileage was because I completely lost my entire short-term memory after about the third day. And this is what happened at the very end of the race. So we finished, we got third, which was great. And we got into Atlantic City. I told the other guy, I'm like, hey man, like I, I cannot drive. I feel like I am incredibly intoxicated. I know we just finished. We literally have like two miles left to go. He's like, oh, don't worry, man. It's fine. I'll, I'll drive. It'll just, it'll be totally good. I'm like, are you sure? He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm totally fine. I'm like, okay. Um, all of a sudden, we're pulling into the hotel ramp, and we hear this, like, screeching noise of, like, sheet metal being torn off. We're like, what the hell is that? And then it, we're pretty slow. So it took us a while, like, oh, shit, we left the bikes on the roof. So, yeah, that was not good at all. So, yeah uh sleep effects not very fun after that i actually when we we're cleaning everything up i passed out on the cement floor for about three hours uh people had a very hard time waking me up uh, that night everyone went out and partied for a while i stayed in the room i went to bed i could not stay awake for my life of me uh, literally they had a party in the room like around me and i didn't hear anything and didn't remember anything at all i was completely out now, of course, people a lot of times will substitute sleep and they will use coffee in its place. Yeah, and that's a topic for a, another time. Uh, but when you're trying to get more sleep, keep in mind of different amounts of stimulants and coffee and other things that you use because that will temporarily change uh, adenosine levels. Is primarily how caffeine works. Um, and that does work acutely, um, but everything has a cost associated with it. That's a whole nother separate lecture. All right, so what do we do about all this stuff? Those to survive, in my opinion, sleep whenever you can. So get as much sleep as you can, and at some point, if you're really low on sleep, just sleep whenever you can, even if you're only getting a few minutes here or there. Now again, we don't have a ton of research on what happens when people are incredibly sleep deprived. Should you sleep a little bit, should you not? This is kind of my biased opinion. I would say take sleep whenever you can get it. Uh, most people I've talked to, especially in the special forces, uh, when they are doing a lot of things where sleep is very scarce, they get very good at getting short amounts of sleep anywhere they can find it. So I would agree with that. Uh, be prepared, right? Uh, have a sleep mask, earplugs, pillow, whatever you need to feel comfortable, use them and get sleep. I actually also like the practice of sleeping in different locations with different sound and even different temperatures. So every so often throughout the year, um, I do a lot of travel. So sleeping in different locations, I'm pretty used to that now. Um, and every once in so often, I'll even sleep on the floor, which again, that sounds pretty miserable and horrible. Uh, for some of you, you may have to bracket that in just so you can get better at the skill of it. Uh, I'm pretty good at sleeping in the back of my car. 
we went to a uh, academic conference. Turns out they screwed up all the rooms and we had four guys in one room with a single bed. So we took turns sleeping on the floor. Uh, so about once every year or so this happens to me and I take two or three nights of sleeping on the floor. You know, I think it's probably a good practice. You may not have to go that extreme. You can try other locations, other beds, uh, play around with different levels of sound. Some people can only sleep when it's absolutely dead quiet. So practice maybe having a little bit of sound, uh, bringing earplugs with you, use earplugs, not use earplugs. Uh, we've been fortunate, we've been down to Costa Rica a couple times and listening to howler monkeys in the morning and even different sounds at night. Uh, play again around with different temperature. Now we'll talk about what ideal is here coming up, uh, but I think there is something to being adapted to being able to sleep at a little bit higher temperatures. And the biggest thing for this is to try to stay out of a sleep debt as much as you possibly can, right? Because let's say worst case happens, the shit hits the fan. If you are in a massive sleep debt already and you have to go into a period of time where you may not get a lot of good sleep for a while, it is absolutely going to suck huge moose balls. You do not want to be in that situation if you can avoid it at all costs. So I would say get as much sleep as you can. Maybe play around with a couple of these different things every once in a while, um, but stay out of a sleep debt as best that you can. So if you do not have a sleep debt, I found you can kind of buffer a couple nights of low sleep pretty easily. If you have a really high sleep debt, your ability to buffer any of those nights goes right out the window. Uh, ability to thrive. For most people, this is gonna be go to bed earlier. Right, just get more sleep. And how do you get more sleep? Well, you do that by getting your carcass into bed earlier. And that usually is the hardest thing for people to do, but also very beneficial. Um, day equals light, dark equals night. Right? Uh, we've got some more information coming up on that next via Mr. Mole, but uh, light does matter. Cooler temperature. Most people will sleep better when it is cooler. Uh, now I get a little bit neurotic about all this stuff, so I even have a little device called an Uller that runs cool water underneath my mattress pad at night so I can have it even be colder. But if you don't have that option, fans are even taking a cooler shower in the evening. And whatever you can do to have a little bit cooler temperature, most people will sleep better than because of that. And like I said, sleep lots, right? Everyone's trying to figure out what is the magic number for them. I tell people just keep going to bed earlier and earlier and earlier until you routinely wake up in the morning before your alarm. If you're doing that, then you're probably got a pretty good idea of how much sleep you need. Like I said, in my case, right now I'm running about nine hours and 40 minutes, so I do pretty good. Now I tend to need more sleep than most clients and other people I consult with, but if you need nine hours and 40 minutes, that's what you need. If you need eight hours and 20 minutes, that's what you need, right? So try to work backwards from there. And my sleep quality is pretty good. It's, I would say it's not uh, architecture wise, it's not amazing. Um, but even if your architecture, your cycling of deep and REM and light is not the best, if you get more sleep, you're just gonna be able to accumulate more times in each of those phases. So it will help offset some of that. Now these things will also help increase your quality of sleep. It kind of goes without saying that if you're using caffeine and other stimulants, cutting down on those, especially later in the day is gonna be beneficial. Some people are very, very sensitive to this. And if you are, you probably know who you are and you don't really need a genetic test to figure that out. So um, cutting back on those will also make a big difference. So we have some more additional references here if you wanna go down that path and read a lot more. And coming up next, we've got an appearance from my wife, Jody Nelson here, who's gonna to talk to you about Mr. Mole Goes to Sleep. Hey there, so Mike queued me up to share with you Mr. Mole Goes to Sleep. So what I'm going to share with you is how this story came about, why it came about, and then a little excerpt with the number one sleep tip. So we'll just read it to you. Mr. Mole started as a funny saying between Mike and me. 
me. He liked to turn off all the lights as it got closer to bedtime. Me? I can't see very well in the dark. So I always turn the lights on in each room as the sun starts to go down. One night, as Mike left his desk from a long session of research rabbit holing, he came around the corner squinting into my brightly lit room, and I said, Hey there, Mr. Mole, how's it going? That little exchange started a funny conversation every time I would find him huddled in the dark researching at his desk as I came in to switch the lights on. After one of these nights, one of us brought up an idea to write a children's book about Mr. Mole going to bed. And then the idea got bigger. What if we write a children's book about healthy sleep habits that adults will read to their children? The action steps would be simple enough for a child, yet probably things that many adults have not incorporated into their sleep and bedtime ritual. This is how Mr. Mole was born, and he's evolved so much since then. It's going to be a wonderful book for everyone. So, let me read to you a little excerpt from Mr. Mole. Mr. Mole has a nice life most would think fine, but there's a problem lately he's had on his mind. I eat right and work out, Mr. Mole said, but my body's tired and my eyes are all red. I sleep at least six hours. That should be enough. So Mr. Mole decided to just be more tough. There's Mr. Mole having a hard time. So he can't even read to his kids. He's that tired. Now I'm going to read to you our number one, number one sleep tip. And that would be to make sure to get up and go for a walk each day. I'm finding the correct. Sourcing sunlight. This is in phase three. So there are three phases of how to get better sleep because you don't want to do 15 things all at once. So take it in phases. In phase three, uh, number two, it says from advanced sleep steps, it says sourcing sunlight. As mentioned above, blue light affects the wake portion of your brain, so we can take the advantage of this during the day. Take a 20-minute walk in the morning to get sunlight and do not use sunglasses. The blue light portion from the sun will hit a special photoreceptors in the eye to help rewire your circadian rhythms. Blue light tells your brain to be awake. Depending on how much your sleep pattern was off and for how long, it may take a few days to a few weeks to normalize. Taking a 20 minute walk will help you feel more energized during the day and more sleepy at night. So there you have it. A little teaser from Mr. Mole Goes to Sleep and also our number one sleep tip, which is actually get up in the morning and go for a walk. So your brain says, hmm, it's time to be awake. And then when it's time to be tired, it'll be better and you'll be able to go to bed and get more sleep. Where to find this book? And you can tell I base this on my husband because it says, the little tagline there says, because I dug up the research already. And you can find the book at www.mrmolebook.com. Enjoy everyone, get better sleep, and stay healthy. <laughs>